Chapter 6744 Roque laughed at Don Quixote's exhortation, and changing the conversation he related the tragic affair of Claudia Geronima, at which Sancho was extremely grieved, for he had not found the young woman's beauty, boldness, and spirit at all amiss. And now the squire's dispatch to make the prize came up, bringing with them two gentlemen on horseback, two pilgrims on foot, and a coach full of women with some six servants on foot and on horseback in attendance on them, and a couple of muleteers whom the gentlemen had with them. The squires made a ring round them, both victors and vanquished maintaining profound silence, waiting for the great Roque Guinart to speak. He asked the gentlemen who they were, whither they were going, and what money they carried with them. Senor, replied one of them, we are two captains of Spanish infantry, our companies are at Naples, and we are on our way to embark in four galleys which they say are at Barcelona under orders for Sicily, and we have about two or three hundred crowns, with which we are, according to our notions, rich and contented, for a soldier's poverty does not allow a more extensive hoard. Roque asked the pilgrims the same questions he had put to the captains, and was answered that they were going to take ship for Rome, and that between them they might have about sixty reals. He asked also who was in the coach, whither they were bound and what money they had, and one of the men on horseback replied, The persons in the coach are my lady Dona Goeomar de Quinones, wife of the regent of the Vicaria at Naples, her little daughter, a handmaid and a duenna, we six servants are in attendance upon her, and the money amounts to six hundred crowns. So then, said Roque Guinart, we have got here nine hundred crowns and sixty reals. My soldiers must number some sixty. See how much there falls to each, for I am a bad arithmetician. As soon as the robbers heard this they raised a shout of long life to Roque Guinart, in spite of the ladras that seek his ruin. The captain showed plainly the concern they felt, the regent's lady was downcast, and the pilgrims did not at all enjoy seeing their property confiscated. Roque kept them in suspense in this way for a while but he had no desire to prolong their distress, which might be seen a bowshot off, and turning to the captains he said, Sirs, will your worships be pleased of your courtesy to lend me sixty crowns, and her ladyship the regent's wife eighty, to satisfy this band that follows me, for it is by his singing the abbot gets his dinner, and then you may at once proceed on your journey, free and unhindered, with a safe minus conduct which I shall give you, so that if you come across any other bands of mine that I have scattered in these parts, they may do you no harm, for I have no intention of doing injury to soldiers, or to any woman, especially one of quality. Profuse and hearty were the expressions of gratitude with which the captains thanked Roque for his courtesy and generosity, for such they regarded his leaving them their own money. Sonora Dona Guayomar de Quinones wanted to throw herself out of the coach to kiss. Don Quixote Chapter 6745 The feet and hands of the great Roque, but he would not suffer it on any account, so far from that, he begged her pardon for the wrong he had done her under pressure of the inexorable necessities of his unfortunate calling. The regent's lady ordered one of her servants to give the eighty crowns that had been assessed as her share at once, for the captains had already paid down their sixty. The pilgrims were about to give up the whole of their little hoard, but Roque bade them keep quiet, and turning to his men he said, Of these crowns two fall to each man and twenty remain over, let ten be given to these pilgrims, and the other ten to this worthy squire that he may be able to speak favorably of this adventure and then having writing materials, with which he always went provided, brought to him, he gave them in writing a safe minus conduct to the leaders of his bands, and bidding them farewell let them go. Free and filled with admiration at his magnanimity, his generous disposition, and his unusual conduct, and inclined to regard him as an Alexander the Great rather than a notorious robber. One of the squires observed in his mixture of Gascon and Catalan, this captain of ours would make a better friar than highwayman, if he wants to be so generous another time, let it be with his own property and not ours. The unlucky white did not speak so low but that Roque overheard him, and drawing his sword almost split his head in two, saying, that is the way I punish impudent saucy fellows. They were all taken aback, and not one of them dared to utter a word, such deference did they pay him. Roque then withdrew to one side and wrote a letter to a friend of his at Barcelona, telling him that the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the knight minus errant of whom there was so much talk, was with him, and was, he assured him, the drollest and wisest man in the world, and that in four days from that date, that is to say, on St. John the Baptist's day, he was going to deposit him in full armor mounted on his horse Rocinante, together with his squire Sancho on an ass, in the middle of the strand of the city, and bidding him give notice of this to his friends the Nieros, that they might divert themselves with him. He wished, he said, his enemies the Cadales could be deprived of this. 
pleasure, but that was impossible because the crazes and shrewd sayings of Don Quixote and the humors of his squire Sancho Panza could not help giving general pleasure to all the world. He dispatched the letter by one of his squires, who, exchanging the costume of a highwayman for that of a peasant, made his way into Barcelona and gave it to the person to whom it was directed. Don Quixote Chapter 6746 Chapter LXI OF WHAT HAPPENED DON QUIXOTE On entering Barcelona, together with other matters that partake of the true rather than of the ingenious. Don Quixote passed three days and three nights with Roque, and had he passed three hundred years, he would have found enough to observe and wonder at in his mode of life. At daybreak they were in one spot, at dinner minus time in another, sometimes they fled without knowing from whom, at other times they lay in wait, not knowing for what. They slept standing, breaking their slumbers to shift from place to place. There was nothing but sending out spies and scouts, posting sentinels and blowing the matches of harquebuses, though they carried but few, for almost all used flintlocks. Roque passed his knights in some place or other apart from his men, that they might not know where he was, for the many proclamations the viceroy of Barcelona had issued against his life kept him in fear and uneasiness, and he did not venture to trust anyone, afraid that even his own men would kill him or deliver him up to the authorities, of a truth. A weary miserable life. At length, by unfrequented roads, shortcuts, and secret paths, Roque, Don Quixote, and Sancho, together, with six squires, set out for Barcelona. They reached the strand on St. John's Eve during the night, and Roque, after embracing Don Quixote and Sancho, to whom he presented the ten crowns he had promised, but had not until then given, left them with many expressions of good minus will on both sides. Roque went back, while Don Quixote remained on horseback, just as he was, waiting for day, and it was not long before the countenance of the fair Aurora began to show itself at the balconies of the east, gladdening the grass and flowers, if not the ear, though to gladden the two there came at the same moment a sound of clarions and drums, and a din of bells, and a tramp, tramp, and cries of clear the way there, of some runners, that seemed to issue from the city. The dawn made way for the sun that with a face broader than a buckler began to rise slowly above the low line of the horizon. Don Quixote and Sancho gazed all round them, they beheld the sea, a sight until then unseen by them, it struck them as exceedingly spacious and broad, much more so than the lakes of Ruidera which they had seen in La Mancha. They saw the galleys along the beach, which, lowering their awnings, displayed themselves decked with streamers and pennons that trembled in the breeze and kissed and swept the water, while on board the bugles, trumpets, and clarions were sounding, and filling the air far and near with melodious warlike notes. Then they began to move and execute a kind of skirmish upon the calm water, while a vast number of horsemen on fine horses, and in showy liveries, issuing from the city, engaged on their side in a somewhat similar movement. The soldiers on board the galleys kept up a ceaseless fire, which they on the walls and forts of the city returned, and the heavy cannon rent the air with the Don Quixote Chapter LXI 747 Tremendous noise they made, to which the gangway guns of the galleys replied. The bright sea, the smiling earth, the clear air minus though at times darkened by the smoke of the guns minus all seemed to fill the whole multitude with unexpected delight. Sancho could not make out how it was that those great masses that moved over the sea had so many feet. And now the horsemen in livery came galloping up with shouts and outlandish cries and cheers to where Don Quixote stood amazed and wondering, and one of them, he to whom Roque had sent word, addressing him exclaimed, Welcome to our city, mirror, beacon, star and cynosure of all night minus errantry in its widest extent. Welcome, I say, valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, not the false, the fictitious, the apocryphal, that these latter days have offered us in lying histories, but the true, the legitimate, the real one that side Hami Penangeli, flower of historians, has described to us. Don Quixote made no answer, nor did the horsemen wait for one, but wheeling again with all their followers, they began curvetting round Don Quixote, who, turning to Sancho, said, These gentlemen have plainly recognized us. I will wager they have read our history, and even that newly printed one by the Aragonese. The cavalier who had addressed Don Quixote again approached him and said, Come with us, Senor Don Quixote, for we are all of us your servants and great friends of Roque Guinarts, to which Don Quixote returned, If courtesy breeds courtesy, yours, Sir Knight, his daughter or very nearly akin to the great Roque's, carry me where you please. I will have no will but yours, especially if you deign to employ it in your service. The cavalier replied with words no less polite, and then, 
all closing in around him, they set out with him for the city, to the music of the clarions and the drums. As they were entering it, the wicked one, who is the author of all mischief, and the boys who are wickeder than the wicked one, contrived that a couple of these audacious irrepressible urchins should force their way through the crowd, and lifting up, one of them Dapple's tail, and the other Rocinante's, insert a bunch of furs under each. The poor beasts felt the strange spurs and added to their anguish by pressing their tails tight, so much so that, cutting a multitude of capers, they flung their masters to the ground. Don Quixote, covered with shame and out of countenance, ran to pluck the plume from his poor jade's tail, while Sancho did the same for Dapple. His conductors tried to punish the audacity of the boys, but there was no possibility of doing so, for they hid themselves among the hundreds of others that were following them. Don Quixote and Sancho mounted once more, and with the same music and acclamations reached their conductor's house, which was large and stately, that of a rich gentleman, in short, and there for the present we will leave them, for such is side Hamid's pleasure. Don Quixote Chapter LXI 748 Chapter LXII W. Hitch deals with the adventure of The Enchanted Head, together with other trivial matters which cannot be left untold. Don Quixote's host was one Don Antonio Moreno by name, a gentleman of wealth and intelligence, and very fond of diverting himself in any fair and good minus natured way, and having Don Quixote in his house he set about devising modes of making him exhibit his mad points in some harmless fashion, for jests that give pain are no jests, and no sport is worth anything if it hurts another. The first thing he did was to make Don Quixote take off his armor, and lead him, in that tight chamois suit we have already described and depicted more than once, out on a balcony overhanging one of the chief streets of the city, in full view of the crowd and of the boys, who gazed at him as they would at a monkey. The cavaliers in livery careered before him again as though it were for him alone, and not to enliven the festival of the day, that they wore it, and Sancho was in high delight, for it seemed to him that, how he knew not, he had fallen upon another Camacho's wedding. Another house like Don Diego de Miranda's, another castle like the Duke's. Some of Don. Antonia's friends dined with him that day, and all showed honor to Don Quixote and treated him as a knight minus errant, and he becoming puffed up and exalted in consequence could not contain himself for satisfaction. Such were the drolleries of Sancho that all the servants of the house, and all who heard him, were kept hanging upon his lips. While at table Don Antonia said to him, We hear, worthy Sancho, that you are so fond of manjar blanco and forced minus meatballs, that if you have any left, you keep them in your bosom for the next day. No, senor, that's not true, said Sancho, for I am more cleanly than greedy, and my master Don Quixote here knows well that we too are used to live for a week on a handful of acorns or nuts. To be sure, if it so happens that they offer me a heifer, I run with a halter, I mean, I eat what I'm given, and make use of opportunities as I find them but whoever says that I'm an out minus of minus the minus way eater or not cleanly, let me tell him that he is wrong, and I'd put it in a different way if I did not respect the honorable beards that are at the table. Indeed, said Don Quixote, Sancho's moderation and cleanliness in eating might be inscribed and graved on plates of brass, to be kept in eternal remembrance in ages to come. It is true that when he is hungry there is a certain appearance of veracity about him, for he eats at a great pace and chews with both jaws, but cleanliness he is always mindful of, and when he was governor he learned how to eat daintily, so much, so that he eats grapes, and even pomegranate pips, with a fork. What, said Don Antonio, has Sancho been a governor? Don Quixote Chapter LXII 749 I, said Sancho, and of an island called Barataria. I governed it to perfection for ten days, and lost my rest all the time, and learned to look down upon all the governments in the world. I got out of it by taking to flight, and fell into a pit where I gave myself up for dead, and out of which I escaped alive by a miracle. Don Quixote then gave them a minute account of the whole affair of Sancho's government, with which he greatly amused his hearers. On the cloth being removed Don Antonio, taking Don Quixote by the hand, passed with him into a distant room in which there was nothing in the way of furniture except a table, apparently of jasper, resting on a pedestal of the same, upon which was set up, after the fashion of the busts of the Roman emperors, a head which seemed to be of bronze. Don Antonio traversed the whole apartment with Don Quixote and walked round the table several times, and then said, Now, Senor Don Quixote, that I am satisfied that no one is listening to us, and that the door is shut, I will tell you of one of the rarest adventures, or more properly speaking strange things, that can be imagined, on condition that you will keep what I say to you in the remotest recesses of secrecy. 
I swear it, said Don Quixote, and for greater security, I will put a flag minus stone over it. For I would have you know, Senor Don Antonio, he had by this time learned his name, that you are addressing one who, though he has ears to hear, has no tongue to speak, so that you may safely transfer whatever you have in your bosom into mine and rely upon it that you have consigned it to the depths of silence. In reliance upon that promise, said Don Antonio, I will astonish you with what you shall see and hear, and relieve myself of some of the vexation it gives me to have no one to whom I can confide my secrets, for they are not of a sort to be entrusted to everybody. Don Quixote was puzzled, wondering what could be the object of such precautions, whereupon Don Antonio taking his hand passed it over the bronze head, and the whole table, and the pedestal of jasper on which it stood, and then said, This head, Senor Don Quixote, has been made and fabricated by one of the greatest magicians and wizards the world ever saw, a Pole, I believe, by birth and a pupil of the famous Escatillo of whom such marvelous stories are told. He was here in my house, and for a consideration of a thousand crowns that I gave him he constructed this head, which has the property and virtue of answering whatever questions are put to its ear. He observed the points of the compass, he traced figures, he studied the stars, he watched favorable moments, and at length brought it to the perfection we shall see to minus morrow for on Fridays it is mute, and this being Friday we must wait till the next day. In the interval your worship may consider what you would like to, Ask it, and I know by experience that in all its answers it tells the truth. Don Quixote was amazed at the virtue and property of the head, and was inclined to disbelieve Don Antonio, but seeing what a short time he had to wait to test the matter he did. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 750 Not choose to say anything except that he thanked him for having revealed to him so mighty a secret. They then quitted the room, Don Antonio locked the door, and they repaired to the chamber where the rest of the gentlemen were assembled. In the meantime Sancho had recounted to them several of the adventures and accidents that had happened his master. That afternoon they took Don Quixote out for a stroll, not in his armor, but in street costume, with a surcoat of tawny cloth upon him, that at that season would have made ice itself sweat. Orders were left with the servants to entertain Sancho, so as not to let him leave the house. Don Quixote was mounted, not on Rocinante, but upon a tall mule of easy pace and handsomely caparisoned. They put the surcoat on him, and on the back, without his perceiving it, they stitched a parchment on which they wrote in large letters, This is Don Quixote of La Mancha. As they set out upon their excursion the placard attracted the eyes of all who chanced to see him, and as they read out, This is Don Quixote of La Mancha, Don Quixote was amazed to see how many people gazed at him, called him by his name, and recognized him, and turning to Don Antonio, who rode at his side, he observed to him, Great are the privileges knight minus errantry involves, for it makes him who professes it known. And famous in every region of the earth, see, Don Antonio, even the very boys of this city. Know me without ever having seen me. True, Senor Don Quixote, returned Don Antonio, for as fire cannot be hidden or kept secret, virtue cannot escape being recognized, and that which is attained by the profession of arms shines distinguished above all others. It came to pass, however, that as Don Quixote was proceeding amid the acclamations that have been described, a Castilian, reading the inscription on his back, cried out in a loud voice, The devil take thee for a Don Quixote of La Mancha. What? Art thou here, and not dead of the countless drubbings that have fallen on thy ribs? Thou art mad, and if thou wert so by thyself, and kept thyself within thy madness, it would not be so bad, but thou hast the gift of making fools and blockheads of all who have anything to do with thee or say to thee. Why, look at these gentlemen bearing thee company. Get thee home, blockhead, and see after thy affairs, and thy wife and children, and give over these fooleries that are sapping thy brains and skimming away thy wits. Go your own way, brother, said Don Antonio, and don't offer advice to those who don't ask you for it. Senor Don Quixote is in his full senses, and we who bear him company are not fools. Virtue is to be honored wherever it may be found, go, and bad luck to you, and don't meddle where you are not wanted. By God, your worship is right, replied the Castilian, for to advise this good man is to kick against the pricks. Still for all that it fills me with pity that the sound what they say the blockhead has in everything should dribble away by the channel of his knight minus errantry. But may the bad luck your worship talks of follow me and all my descendants if, from this day forth, though I should live longer than Methuselah, I ever give advice to anybody even if he. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 751 Ask me for it. The advice minus giver took himself off, and they continued their stroll, 
but so great was the press of the boys and people to read the placard that Don Antonio was forced to remove it as if he were taking off something else. Night came and they went home, and there was a ladies dancing party, for Don Antonio's wife, a lady of rank and gaiety, beauty and wit, had invited some friends of hers to come and do honor to her guest and amuse themselves with his strange delusions. Several of them came, they supped sumptuously, the dance began at about ten o'clock. Among the ladies were two of a mischievous and frolicsome turn, and, though perfectly modest, somewhat free in playing tricks for harmless diversion's sake. These two were so indefatigable in taking Don Quixote out to dance that they tired him down, not only in body, but in spirit. It was a sight to see the figure Don Quixote made, long, lank, lean and yellow, his garments clinging tight to him, ungainly, and above all anything but agile. The gay ladies made secret love to him, and he on his part secretly repelled them, but finding himself hard-pressed by their blandishments he lifted up his voice and exclaimed, Fugite parties. Adversi. Leave me in peace, unwelcome overtures, avaunt, with your desires, ladies, for. She who is queen of mine, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, suffers none, but hers to lead me captive and subdue me, and so saying he sat down on the floor in the middle of the room, tired out and broken down by all this exertion in the dance. Don Antonio directed him to be taken up bodily and carried to bed, and the first that laid hold of him was Sancho, saying as he did so, in an evil hour you took to dancing, master mine, do you fancy all mighty men of valor are dancers and all knights minus errant given to capering? If you do, I can tell you you are mistaken, there's many a man would rather undertake to kill a giant than cut a caper. If it had been the shoe minus fling you were it I could take your place, for I can do the shoe minus fling like a gerfalcon, but I'm no good at dancing. With these and other observations Sancho set the whole ball minus room laughing, and then put his master to bed, covering him up well so that he might sweat out any chill caught after his dancing. The next day Don Antonio thought he might as well make trial of the enchanted head, and with Don Quixote, Sancho, and two others, friends of his, besides the two ladies that had tired out Don Quixote at the ball, who had remained for the night with Don Antonio's wife, he locked himself up in the chamber where the head was. He explained to them the property it possessed and entrusted the secret to them, telling them that now for the first time he was going to try the virtue of the enchanted head, but except Don Antonio's two friends no one else was privy to the mystery of the enchantment, and if Don Antonio had not first revealed it to them they would have been inevitably reduced to the same state of amazement as the rest, so artfully and skillfully was it contrived. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 752 the first to approach the ear of the head was Don Antonio himself, and in a low voice, but not so low as not to be audible to all, he said to it, Head, tell me by the virtue that lies in thee what am I at this moment thinking of? The head, without any movement of the lips, answered in a clear and distinct voice, so as to be heard by all, I cannot judge of thoughts. All were thunderstruck at this, and all the more so as they saw that there was nobody anywhere near the table or in the whole room that could have answered. How many of us are here? asked Don Antonio once more, and it was answered him in the same way softly, thou and thy wife, with two friends of thine and two of hers, and a famous knight called Don Quixote of La Mancha, and a squire of his, Sancho Panza by name. Now there was fresh astonishment, now everyone's hair was standing on end with awe, and Don Antonio retiring from the head exclaimed, this suffices to show me that I have not been deceived by him who sold thee to me, O sage head, talking head, answering head, wonderful head. Let someone else go and put what question he likes to it. And as women are commonly impulsive and inquisitive, the first to come forward was one of the two friends of Don Antonio's wife, and her question was, tell me, head, what shall I do to be very beautiful? And the answer she got was, be very modest. I question thee no further, said the fair querist. Her companion then came up and said, I should like to know, head, whether my husband loves me or not. The answer given to her was, Think how he uses thee, and thou mayest guess. And the married lady went off saying, That answer did not need a question, for of course the treatment one receives shows the disposition of him from whom it is received. Then one of Don Antonio's two friends advanced and asked it, Who am I? Thou knowest, was the answer. That is not what I ask thee, said the gentleman, but to tell me if thou knowest me. Yes, I know thee, thou art Don Pedro Noarize, was the reply. I do not seek to know more, said the gentleman, for this is enough to convince me, O head, that thou knowest everything, and as he retired the other friend came forward and asked it, Tell me, head, what are the wishes of my eldest son? 
I have said already, was the answer, that I cannot judge of wishes, however, I can tell thee the wish of thy son is to bury thee. That's what I see with my eyes I point out with my finger, said the gentleman, so I ask no more. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 753 Don Antonio's wife came up and said, I know not what to ask thee, head, I would only seek to know of thee if I shall have many years of enjoyment of my good husband, and the answer she received was, Thou shalt, for his vigor and his temperate habits promise many years of life, which by their intemperance others so often cut short. Then Don Quixote came forward and said, Tell me, thou that answerest, was that which I describe as having happened to me in the cave of Montesinos the truth, or a dream? Will Sancho's whipping be accomplished without fail? Will the disenchantment of Dulcinea be brought about? As to the question of the cave, was the reply, there is much to be said, there is something of both in it. Sancho's whipping will proceed leisurely. The disenchantment of Dulcinea will attain its due consummation. I seek to know no more, said Don Quixote, let me but see Dulcinea disenchanted, and I will consider that all the good fortune I could wish for has come upon me all at once. The last questioner was Sancho, and his questions were, Head, shall I by any chance have another government? Shall I ever escape from the hard life of a squire? Shall I get back to see my wife and children? To which the answer came, Thou shalt govern in thy house, and if thou returnest to it thou shalt see thy wife and children, and on ceasing to serve thou shalt cease to be a squire. Good by God, said Sancho Panza, I could have told myself that, the prophet Peregrello could have said no more. What answer wouldst thou have, beast, said Don Quixote, is it not enough that the replies this head has given suit the questions put to it? Yes, it is enough, said Sancho, but I should have liked it to have made itself plainer and told me more. The questions and answers came to an end here, but not the wonder with which all were filled, except Don Antonio's two friends who were in the secret. This side Hamid Benengeli thought fit to reveal at once, not to keep the world in suspense, fancying that the head had some strange magical mystery in it. He says, therefore, that on the model of another head, the work of an image maker, which he had seen at Madrid, Don Antonio made this one at home for his own amusement and to astonish ignorant people, and its mechanism was as follows. The table was of wood painted and varnished to imitate jasper, and the pedestal on which it stood was of the same material, with four eagle's claws projecting from it to support the weight more steadily. The head, which resembled a bust or figure of a Roman emperor, and was colored like bronze, was hollow throughout, as was the table, into which it was fitted so exactly that no trace of the joining was visible. The pedestal of the Don Quixote Chapter LXII 754 Table was also hollow and communicated with the throat and neck of the head, and the hole was in communication with another room underneath the chamber in which the head stood. Through the entire cavity in the pedestal, table, throat and neck of the bust or figure, there passed a tube of tin carefully adjusted and concealed from sight. In the room below corresponding to the one above was placed the person who was to answer, with his mouth to the tube, and the voice, as in an ear minus trumpet, passed from above downwards, and from below upwards, the words coming clearly and distinctly, it was impossible thus, to detect the trick. A nephew of Don Antonio's, a smart sharp minus witted student, was the answerer, and as he had been told beforehand by his uncle who the persons were that would come with him that day into the chamber where the head was, it was an easy matter for him to answer the first question at once and correctly, the others he answered by guess minus work, and being. Clever, cleverly. Side Hamid adds that this marvelous contrivance stood for some ten or. Twelve days, but that, as it became noised abroad through the city, that he had in his house an enchanted head that answered all who asked questions of it, Don Antonio, fearing it might come to the ears of the watchful sentinels of our faith, explained the matter to the inquisitors, who commanded him to break it up and have done with it, lest the ignorant vulgar should be scandalized. By Don Quixote, however, and by Sancho the head was still held to be an enchanted one, and capable of answering questions, though more to Don Quixote's satisfaction than Sancho's. The gentlemen of the city, to gratify Don Antonio and also to do the honors to Don Quixote, and give him an opportunity of displaying his folly, made arrangements for a tilting at the ring in six days from that time, which however, for reason that will be mentioned hereafter, did not take place. Don Quixote took a fancy to stroll about the city quietly and on foot, for he feared that if he went on horseback the boys would follow him, so he and Sancho and two servants that Don Antonio gave him set out for a walk. 
Thus it came to pass that going along one of the streets Don Quixote lifted up his eyes and saw written in very large letters over a door, books printed here, at which he was vastly pleased, for until then he had never seen a printing office, and he was curious to know what it was like. He entered with all his following, and saw them drawing sheets in one place, correcting in another, setting up type here, revising there, in short all the work that is to be seen in great printing offices. He went up to one case and asked what they were about there, the workman told him, he watched them with wonder, and passed on. He approached one man, among others, and asked him what he was doing. The workman replied, Senor, this gentleman here, pointing to a man. Of prepossessing appearance and a certain gravity of look, has translated an Italian book. Into our Spanish tongue, and I am setting it up in type for the press. What is the title of the book? asked Don Quixote, to which the author replied, Senor, in Italian the book is called La Bagatelle. And what does La Bagatelle import in our Spanish? asked Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Chapter LXII 755. Lo bagatelle, said the author, is as though we should say in Spanish Los Jigites, but though the book is humble in name it has good solid matter in it. I, said Don Quixote, have some little smattering of Italian, and I plume myself on singing some of Ariosto's stanzas, but tell me, Senor Minus, I do not say this to test your ability, but merely out of curiosity Minus have you ever met with the word pignata in your book? Yes, often, said the author. And how do you render that in Spanish? How should I render it, returned the author, but by Alia. Body o me, exclaimed Don Quixote, what a proficient you are in the Italian language. I would lay a good wager that where they say in Italian pace you say in Spanish place, and where they say piu you say mas, and you translate su by arriba and ju by abajo. I translate them so of course, said the author, for those are their proper equivalents. I would venture to swear, said Don Quixote, that your worship is not known in the world, which always begrudges their reward to rare wits and praiseworthy labors. What talents lie wasted there? What genius thrust away into corners? What worth left neglected? Still it seems to me that translation from one language into another, if it be not from the queens of languages, the Greek and the Latin, is like looking at Flemish tapestries on the wrong side, for though the figures are visible, they are full of threads that make them indistinct, and they do not show with the smoothness and brightness of the right side, and translation from easy languages argues neither ingenuity nor command of words, any more than transcribing or copying out one document from another. But I do not mean by this to draw the inference that no credit is to be allowed for the work of translating, for a man may employ himself in ways worse and less profitable to himself. This estimate does not include two famous translators, Dr. Cristobal de Figueroa, in his Pastor Fido, and Don Wanda. Yoregi in his Aminta, wherein by their felicity they leave it in doubt which is the translation, and which the original. But tell me, are you printing this book at your own risk, or have you sold the copyright to some bookseller? I print at my own risk, said the author, and I expect to make a thousand ducats at least by this first edition, which is to be of two thousand copies that will go off in a twinkling at six reals apiece. A fine calculation you are making, said Don Quixote, it is plain you don't know the ins and outs of the printers, and how they play into one another's hands. I promise you when you find yourself saddled with 2,000 copies you will feel so sore that it will astonish you, particularly if the book is a little out of the common and not in any way highly spiced. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 756 What said the author, would your worship, then, have me give it to a bookseller who will give three maravedas for the copyright and think he is doing me a favor? I do not print my books to win fame in the world, for I am known in it already by my works. I want to make money, without which reputation is not worth a rap. God send your worship good luck, said Don Quixote, and he moved on to another case, where he saw them correcting a sheet of a book with the title of Light of the Soul. Noticing it he observed, books like this, though there are many of the kind, are the ones that deserve to be printed, for many are the sinners in these days, and lights unnumbered are needed for all that are in darkness. He passed on, and saw they were also correcting another book, and when he asked its title they told him it was called, The Second Part of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by one of Tortillas. I have heard of this book already, said Don Quixote, and verily, and on my conscience, I thought it had been by this time burned to ashes as a meddlesome intruder, 
but its martmas will come to it as it does to every pig, for fictions have the more merit and charm about them the more nearly they approach the truth, or what looks like it, and true stories, the truer they are the better they are, and so saying he walked out of the printing office with a certain amount of displeasure in his looks. That same day Don Antonio arranged to take him to see the galleys that lay at the beach, whereat Sancho was in high delight, as he had never seen any all his life. Don Antonio sent word to the commandant of the galleys that he intended to bring his guest, the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, of whom the commandant and all the citizens had already heard, that afternoon to see them, and what happened on board of them will be told in the next chapter. Don Quixote Chapter LXII 757 Chapter LXI Of the mishap that befell Sancho Panza through the visit to the galleys and the strange adventure of the fair Morisco. Profound were Don Quixote's reflections on the reply of the enchanted head, not one of them, however, hitting on the secret of the trick, but all concentrated on the promise, which he regarded as a certainty, of Dulcinea's disenchantment. This he turned over in his mind again and again with great satisfaction, fully persuaded that he would shortly see its fulfillment, and as for Sancho though, as has been said, he hated being a governor, still he had a longing to be giving orders and finding himself obeyed once more, this is the misfortune that being in authority, even in jest, brings with it. To resume, that afternoon their host Don Antonio Moreno, and his two friends, with Don Quixote and Sancho, went to the galleys. The commandant had been already made aware of his good fortune in seeing two such famous persons as Don Quixote and Sancho, and the instant they came to the shore all the galleys struck their awnings and the clarions rang out. A skiff covered with rich carpets and cushions of crimson velvet was immediately lowered into the water, and as Don Quixote stepped on board of it, the leading galley fired her gangway gun, and the other galleys did the same, and as he mounted the starboard ladder the whole crew saluted him, as is the custom when a personage of distinction comes on board a galley, by exclaiming who 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 three times. The general, for so we shall call him, a Valencian gentleman of rank, gave him his hand and embraced him, saying, I shall mark this day with a white stone as one of the happiest I can expect to enjoy in my lifetime. Since I have seen Senor Don Quixote of La Mancha, pattern and image wherein we see. Contained and condensed all that is worthy in knight minus errantry. Don Quixote delighted beyond measure with such a lordly reception, replied to him in words no less courteous. All then proceeded to the poop, which was very handsomely decorated, and seated themselves on the bulwark benches, the bosun passed along the gangway and piped all hands to strip, which they did in an instant. Sancho, seeing such a number of men stripped to the skin, was taken aback, and still more when he saw them spread the awning so briskly that it seemed to him as if all the devils were at work at it, but all this was cakes and fancy bread to what I am going to tell now. Sancho was seated on the captain's stage, close to the aftermost rower on the right minus hand side. He, previously instructed in what he was to do, laid hold of Sancho, hoisting him up in his arms, and the whole crew, who were standing ready, beginning on the right, proceeded to pass him on, whirling him along from hand to hand and from bench to bench with such rapidity that it took the sight out of poor Sancho's eyes, and he made quite sure that the devils themselves were flying away with him, nor did they leave off with him until they had sent him back. Don Quixote Chapter LC 758 along the left side and deposited him on the poop, and the poor fellow was left bruised and breathless, and all in a sweat, and unable to comprehend what it was that had happened to him. Don Quixote when he saw Sancho's flight without wings asked the general if this was a usual ceremony with those who came on board the galleys for the first time, for, if so, as he had no intention of adopting them as a profession, he had no mind to perform such feats of agility, and if anyone offered to lay hold of him to whirl him about, he vowed to God he would kick his soul out and as he said this he stood up and clapped his hand upon his sword. At this instant they struck the awning and lowered the yard with a prodigious rattle. Sancho thought heaven was coming off its hinges and going to fall on his head, and full of terror he ducked it and buried it between his knees, nor were Don Quixote's knees altogether under control, for he too shook a little, squeezed his shoulders together and lost color. The crew then hoisted the yard with the same rapidity and clatter as when they lowered it all the while keeping silence as though they had neither voice nor breath. The bosun gave the signal to weigh anchor, and leaping upon the middle of the gangway began to lay on to the shoulders of the crew with his courbash or whip, and to haul out gradually to sea. When Sancho saw so many red feet, 
for such he took the oars to be, moving all together, he said to himself, it's these that are the real chanted things, and not the ones my master talks of. What can those wretches have done to be so whipped, and how does that one man who goes along their whistling dare to whip so many? I declare this is hell, or at least purgatory. Don Quixote, observing how attentively Sancho regarded what was going on, said to him, Ah, Sancho my friend, how quickly and cheaply might you finish off the disenchantment of Dulcinea, if you would strip to the waist and take your place among those gentlemen. Amid the pain and sufferings of so many you would not feel your own much, and moreover perhaps the sage Merlin would allow each of these lashes, being laid on with a good hand, to count for ten of those which you must give yourself at last. The general was about to ask what these lashes were and what was Dulcinea's disenchantment, when a sailor exclaimed, Manjui signals that there is an oared vessel off the coast to the west. On hearing this the general sprang upon the gangway crying, Now then, my sons, don't let her give us the slip. It must be some Algerine corsair brigantine that the watchtower signals to us. The three others immediately came alongside the chief galley to receive their orders. The general ordered two to put out to sea while he with the other kept in shore, so that in this way the vessel could not escape them. The crews plied the oars driving the galleys so furiously that they seemed to fly. The two that had put out to sea, after a couple of miles sighted a vessel which, so far as they could make out, they judged to be one of fourteen or fifteen banks, and so she proved. As soon as the vessel discovered the galleys. Don Quixote Chapter LC 759 She went about with the object and in the hope of making her escape by her speed, but the attempt failed, for the chief galley was one of the fastest vessels afloat, and overhauled her so rapidly that they on board the brigantine saw clearly there was no possibility of escaping, and the rice therefore would have had them drop their oars and give themselves up so as not to provoke the captain in command of our galleys to anger. But chance, directing things otherwise, so ordered it that just as the chief galley came close enough for those on board the vessel to hear the shouts from her calling on them to surrender, two Taraquas, that is to say two Turks, both drunken, that with a dozen more were on board the brigantine, discharged their muskets, killing two of the soldiers that lined the sides of our vessel. Seeing this the general swore he would not leave one of those he found on board the vessel alive. But as he bore down furiously upon her she slipped away from him underneath the oars. The Galley shot a good way ahead, those on board the vessel saw their case was desperate, and while the galley was coming about they made sail, and by sailing and rowing once more tried to sheer off, but their activity did not do them as much good as their rashness did them harm, for the galley coming up with them in a little more than half a mile threw her oars over them, and took the whole of them alive. The other two galleys now joined company and all four returned with the prize to the beach, where a vast multitude stood waiting for them, eager to see what they brought back. The general anchored close in, and perceived that the viceroy of the city was on the shore. He ordered the skiff to push off to fetch him, and the yard to be lowered for the purpose of hanging forth with the rice, and the rest of the men taken on board the vessel, about six minus and minus thirty in number, all smart fellows and most of them Turkish musketeers. He asked which was the rice of the brigantine, and was answered. In Spanish by one of the prisoners, who afterwards proved to he a Spanish renegade, this young man, senor that you see here is our rice, and he pointed to one of the handsomest and most gallant minus looking youths that could be imagined. He did not seem to be twenty years of age. Tell me, dog, said the general, what led thee to kill my soldiers, when thou sawest it was impossible for thee to escape? Is that the way to behave to chief galleys? Knowest thou not that rashness is not valor? Faint prospects of success should make men bold, but not rash. The rice was about to reply, but the general could not at that moment listen to him, as he had to hasten to receive the viceroy, who was now coming on board the galley, and with him certain of his attendants and some of the people. You have had a good chase, senor general, said the viceroy. Your excellency shall soon see how good by the game strung up to this yard, replied the general. How so, returned the viceroy. Don Quixote.